Now that we've talked some about the nature of Spark and its relationship to big data, it's time to actually look a little bit at Spark and try to do some stuff with it. So, in order to do this, you need to have Spark on your computer. So go to spark.apache.org, and under the Downloads tab, you'll see that you can download whatever the most recent version is. At the time of this video, it is 2.2. Uh, you should, so all of my videos will use that. You should use whatever is current. I did pull down the version that comes with Hadoop. If you already have a Hadoop install, you could choose to use that, but it's simplest to just go with the, the version that has that prepackaged, a download, and then I just click this, and as you can see, I recently downloaded it there. Then I unpackaged it, and you'll want to do that on your computer. And I also went through and put the directories that have executable stuff in it in my path. So what are those directories? Well, when I unpackaged it, I got a directory in my home directory called spark 2.2 bin hadoop 2.7. And if I look in that directory, you'll see there is a bin subdirectory and an sbin subdirectory along with another a number of other subdirectories in here. I added bin and sbin to my path, and that allows me to run Spark without typing in uh, a long path. So if we just want to do a simple run of Spark, the easiest way to do that is to run the Spark shell. Now if I just type in Spark shell like this, it will start up with a local server. We can actually specify that explicitly. We can say master and pass it local and then in brackets we get to tell it how many threads or cores we wish to use. If you put in an asterisk there it will use as many as your computer has. So I'll start this up. Hopefully you paused this and went and installed Spark if you didn't have it. The Spark shell itself is actually a uh, very much a Scala REPL and so we can type in basic Scala commands but it has a few things that have been set up for us when we come into here and so as a Scala REPL I can do things like 4 plus 5 and I get the same feedback that I would have from uh, doing this in Scala but they have set up a Spark context which is stored in a variable called SC and a Spark session that's available in a variable called Spark. We'll talk about the Spark uh, session a little bit later. We do need to deal with the Spark context in the near future because we want to, we're going to use the Spark context for basically giving us access uh, to what Spark can do. So let's go ahead and look at the documentation and we'll real quick pull up the API so we can come down here. They have several APIs for the different languages these are in. Scala 1 is listed first. And if we come down here, let's see, actually Spark Context will be right up here near the top. So what can we do with our Spark Context? Well, there's actually quite a few different methods that are available on here. We could do something like open a text file. Uh, text file, we give it a path, and we can specify a minimum number of partitions, though that will default to a value, and that gives us back something called an RDD of strings. We'll come back in the next video and explore the nature of RDDs. So just to make sure that this works, we have been playing some here previously with this text file, which is actually in a subdirectory. So I want to do sc.text file, and let's see if this works. So let's see. We'll see if that is actually in my current directory. And just to check on it, we can do sc.take5. Oops, sorry not SC, this res3. 
which gave us back something called an RDD, which we'll look at shortly. Take five. And sure enough, those look like lines from the file that, that we've been playing with. Okay, so that appears to work. So that's one way of running things under Spark. Another way of doing this is programmatically, in fact, when we, we will write a program when we come back in the next video, we'll write a program and we will set up our own Spark context inside of here. And then we will be able to export that program. Uh, we can run it inside of Eclipse with a local, uh, but if you really want to use a uh, more computing power to really use the proper power of, of Spark, you would set up a cluster to run it under. In order to do that, we need to create what are called fat jars. And so there's a project called SBT Assembly. And if you go to the SBT Assembly website, it has some very simple instructions. All we need to do is create a new file, project assembly.sbt, which I have done here. And I've copied this one line in there. And what that will do is now when we package our uh, our application inside of SBT, we'll get what are called fat jars. And these fat jars have all the libraries that they need associated with them available. Those we can then run on a server using a program called Spark Submit. So if, when we were running Spark Submit, we'll come back and we'll play with this a little bit more. There are a number of options we can specify. For example, we can specify a master. Again, if I don't have a cluster, I could run this locally. Yeah, I was afraid of that. Spark submit hyphen hyphen master of local dollar, sorry, asterisk. You can specify the class that you want to run. We don't have one of these yet because we haven't written our stuff. And then the jar file that you want to run it in, which will be something that will be created in your target directory, and then Scala you know, dot dot dot. There will be more details to this. We'll come back and see how we can do that. But these are going to be our main two ways of running Spark programs. We will either play around in the Spark shell, which like any REPL is good for kind of an interactive messing with stuff. And then we can also run, I guess, kind of medium-sized things, because we'll pretty much only do these locally inside of Eclipse. And then if we have a cluster to run on, we can do something bigger by exporting the fat jar out and then using Spark Submit to run those things. So we'll stop this here. When we come back, we'll actually write a program that uses Spark We'll read in our data. We'll also look at our DDs and talk about what they are, and then use that knowledge to do some of our data processing with an RDD.